What made me want to journey in this big undertaking? My grandmother's maiden name was LaFleur. I had an old history book at home and I saw that name come up and I just wondered what was the relationship. Could she have been a slave of the LaFleurs? And that made me want to take this journey and find out more. So as I found out her relationship with the LaFleurs, then there were, there began to be a lot of unanswered questions that I pursued. While at my mom's house going through some of her things, I ran across an old Mississippi history book. And throughout that history book, I saw the word LaFleur, the name LaFleur. And that kind of piqued my interest because my grandmother, Georgia LaFleur Reed, was a LaFleur. And I wanted to see the connection with her name and the LaFleurs that I read about in that history book. And first and foremost, as I got into my research, a lot of people helped me along the way and I was able to create a lot of bonds and relationships with those people. And I sincerely appreciate all that they gave me and how they open up with information about our family. John Smith is one of them, and also Dorothy Price, Lillian Morey, Alice Nason, Rainy LaFleur, Frankie LaFleur, Eunice and Mamie, Susie Price, Thelma. All of these people helped me along the way and gave me interesting details about the family. So then, if they hadn't provided me with this information, I would not have otherwise known a lot of this. So as I get into the presentation, it's important that you are familiar with some of the words that I encounter in order for you to understand uh, certain parts of this presentation. The initials IT being one of them because that was in a document throughout the uh, research that I had. And that simply meant in Indian Territory, which is now present day Oklahoma. Immigrate. The Indians had to immigrate to another land. And that means to leave one's country or a state and go and live in another area. Removal. The Choctaw Indians were removed in, from Mississippi in 1831. They started those negotiations in 1830. So they moved to lands west of the Mississippi River. That was important, an important treaty for them to be able to do that. And that treaty was called the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. That's where they wrote that treaty at, or that's where they agreed to the Indians being removed there. Of course, they did not want to go. So then uh, Greenwood LaFleur thought he would go to the Capitol to speak with Andrew Jackson, the president at that time, 
about adding an article to that. And it's referred to as being Article 14 of the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. And in that article, there's a stipulation that says they could stay in Mississippi if they chose, some of them could stay, but they would have to become American citizens. They would get an allotment of land. And if they had children in their household who were 10 years old or older, would get half the amount of land that the older person would get. Shadow. Shadow is property. So then I'll be using these words and hope you understand from that. I started my research based on the application of Solomon LaFleur for the doll's role. He gave application in order to receive land from the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek under Article 14. Though he was not very familiar with that article, he just knew he would get land and the children in his household that were 10 or older would also get land. The information that he gave in his doll's application, because that was in 1906, that he applied to receive that land. And that's when he applied to get on the doll's roll. So when you make that application, whether you're rejected or not, they fill out some forms, and on those forms, we learn a great deal of information. And when I say we, I'm talking about researchers. Because on that form, he said uh, it was said that his father's name is Jackson LaFleur. His mother's name was Caroline LaFleur. And that his children at that time who were living in his household was Mary LaFleur, who was 14, Lou Virtus, and they spelled it phonetically and probably not the way it was supposed to be spelled, who was 11 years old, and then Martha, who was seven years old. Solomon had another daughter. Her name was Betty Rainbow, and she was older, so she had to apply for this land on her own. And the way she was applying, was through him because he had Indian blood. So she thought she could acquire the land through her father, Solomon. And Solomon was trying to acquire the land through his father, Jackson LaFleur, as he stated on the application. There were groups uh, back when Solomon, where Solomon and his family lived, and these uh, were referred to as either being black, a mixed blood, a full-blooded Indian, or mulatto. If a person was mixed with white or Indian, they referred to that person as being a mixed blood. If a person was mixed with white and black, then that person was a mulatto, is what they described them as being person was a mulatto, is what they described them as being. So, during my research in me trying to find out about my grandmother and how she was related to the LaFleurs, I found out that she is the niece, great-great-niece of an Indian chief who lived in Greenwood, Mississippi, and his name was Greenwood LaFleur. Of course, they would probably not recognize her as being a great, great niece, but according to Solomon, his father was Jackson LaFleur, and so Greenwood LaFleur was Jackson LaFleur's brother. Greenwood LaFleur was a mixed blood because his mother was part Indian, and his father was white. So he was referred to as a mixed blood. And back then, mixed bloods carried a lot of prestige back in that time. We are also descendants of a governor of Indian territory. 
His name was Basil LaFleur. Basil LaFleur was a mixed blood. He was a brother of Greenwood LaFleur and Jackson LaFleur. Our ancestors were slaves, but their slave owners were not white. Their slave owners were Choctaw. That is, they were mixed bloods. They were mixed with Choctaw and white, but they identified as being Choctaw. The slave owners of our ancestors were two people, Basil LaFleur and Benjamin LaFleur. Benjamin LaFleur is another brother of Greenwood LaFleur and Jackson LaFleur. As a matter of fact, he was the oldest. He married a lady named Mary Juzanne. And they lived in Carthage, Mississippi. I read one time that the LaFleurs who lived in and around Carthage, Mississippi were probably slaves of Benjamin LaFleur. And that was uh, in the 1800s. And that's also true about people with last name LaFleurs who lived who at one time lived in and around Greenwood, Mississippi and all that area were probably slaves of Greenwood LaFleur. Our story begins with a man named Louis LaFleur. He was the patriarch of the LaFleur family. He was brought over to South Florida by his parents and he lived there with his siblings and his parents. His parents passed away within a month of each other from a disease. So Louis LaFleur took his brother Michael, who was younger, and they rode up and down the Mississippi River, River in a keel boat. And they did a lot of trading with the Indians or with everyone. They went to Canada a lot. That's why they refer to him as being uh, French Canadian. So he started to live among the Choctaw Indians and there he started to speak the language. He also respected Andrew Jackson a great deal because he rode with him in many battles. Louis LaFleur was uh, lived with his parents and nine siblings in Mobile French territory. They were from France. There were eight girls and two boys. And his parents passed away, so he and his brother Michael traveled up and down the Mississippi River and traded with Indians and a lot of other people. And he became known as the French Canadian. Louis LaFleur had three wives. Wife one was Hokey Hokey, was her name. He had two children by that wife. Wife two had a twin. Her name was Rebecca Kravitz and the other one, Nancy Kravitz. Nancy had five children, with the youngest being Forbes. Rebecca had eight children by Louis LaFleur. Benjamin was the oldest, Greenwood was the middle, Basil and Jackson were the younger ones. Nancy and Rebecca were not full-blood Indians. Their mother, grandmother, and their great-grandmother all married white men, either French or English men. Nancy and Rebecca were mixed blood. Next, Rebecca was about 45 when she had Jackson LaFleur. She passed away when Jackson was five years old. It was stated that when Forbes' mother, Nancy, passed away, that he went to live with an older sister, and then from there he went to Choctaw School in Kentucky. 
So then, a few years later, Jackson's and Basil's mother passed away. So I'm thinking that they probably went to live with an older sister until they went to Choctaw School in Kentucky. Jackson LaFleur was the only one of the siblings that was not born at LaFleur's Bluff. I think the two families lived together. The 14 children that ja that Louis LaFleur had, I think they lived in the same household. Because I read that usually the siblings and the two wives would live in the same household or sometimes separate households. But I these were born in the same area, so I would think that they lived in the same household. All of these children were born in Lafleur's Bluff, except for Jackson. Lafleur's Bluff is the old capital site in Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson Lafleur was born along the Natchez Trace, where Louis LaFleur had a camp stand. It was called French Camp Stand. Louis Jackson LaFleur was born in 1815. There was a gap in his birth and Basil LaFleur's. From 1810, Basil was born in 1810. Jackson was born in 1815. Louis LaFleur was adventuresome, so he was off on a mission in the War of 1812 with Andrew Jackson at that time and a group of Choctaw Indians fighting with Andrew Jackson. Jackson LaFleur is named after Andrew Jackson because Louis LaFleur thought so highly of Andrew Jackson. So then, we are descendants of Louis LaFleur and Rebecca Kravitz, that twin. They would be most of our great, 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 great grandparents. We are also descendants of their youngest son, Jackson, and one of his slaves. Her name was Caroline. It has been stated that a former governor of Mississippi, at least he stated it, that he is also a LaFleur descendant through one of the sisters of Jackson LaFleur. Jackson LaFleur was in boarding school in Kentucky in 1832. He received news that his father had passed away in 1833. So then he had to travel from Kentucky to Mississippi uh, to attend the final documents and go over the final documents that dealt with his father's death, his inheritance and all of that. So, whenever he got to Mississippi, he had a choice to make, whether or not he wanted to go to Indian Territory or if he wanted to stay in Mississippi and receive land under the Article 14 of the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. He and Basil chose to go to Indian Territory. So, when he got there to Mississippi, he was given 25 slaves, and those 25 slaves, it wasn't stated in anything I've read, but I do believe that those slaves he inherited from his father's estate. So he was made captain over a group of people that were traveling to Indian Territory, and this by this time would be the third removal. They had a removal in 1831, one in 1832, and one in 1833. 
So then I have a list of the people that went to Indian Territory with Jackson LaFleur. One of those people was Caroline LaFleur, and she was 18 years old. So she was one of the 25 slaves he went with. I'm trying to put together how Jackson LaFleur and Caroline LaFleur came together and fell in love with each other. And it is my belief, since Jackson LaFleur was in school in Kentucky, when he arrived home in 1833, and then during that short time, he left and went to Indian Territory with a group of slaves, he did not have time to form a relationship with anyone else other than Caroline. So that is my belief how he fell in love with Caroline because they were close together all the time. He did not stay in Indian Territory for very long. According to Solomon in his document, he said that it was it was too sickly there. He didn't say if Jackson was sickly. So I'm assuming he meant that there was a lot of sickness around. And so they made the decision, they being him and Caroline, or just they being Jackson alone. He made the decision to go back to Mississippi after that because of the sickness. Now, if you will recall in the history of the removal there was a lot of sickness there. So that statement by Solomon confirms this. And you wonder how Solomon knew all of the information about it being sickly there or if Jackson is his father, if all of that. He was not born then. Remember, Solomon was 67 years old when he gave this application for the doll's role. So who told him all of this? And how did he remember all of this? It was not a made-up story. People don't remember those facts like that verbatim. So I do believe, and this is not written anywhere, that his mother told him that. That they lived in a way as husband and wife that it, the situation presented itself that way. So he made assumptions too. That Jackson was his father, his mother verified that. And she told the story of them going to Oklahoma and all of the things that they encountered there and why they moved. So he stayed there a short period of time. And then they moved to Carroll County. Solomon again stated in the application that he lived on his father's plantation in Carroll, Carroll County. Documents from Jackson LaFleur's estate shows that he did own land in Carroll County. So this too was verified. Jackson and Caroline had four children together. Daniel was one of them. He was the oldest. He was probably born around 1833 to 1834, excuse me, or 1835. Delia, about 1836. Solomon, around 1841. And Mary, around 1848. Daniel, Delia, Solomon, Mary. We are descendants of this little family unit right here. With Caroline being the head of that family. So then the documents show that Jackson passed away in 1854 suddenly. He was 39 years old. Very young, however unmarried. Another reason why I think he did not have a relationship with anyone else because I believe if he didn't get married and just decided to use Caroline as a concubine 
to me, he had respect for her and decided to um, live as husband and wife with her. And that's my opinion. So after he passed away, uh, two years after he passed away, a document was written up by uh, Greenwood LaFleur's son-in-law. A document was written up by Benjamin LaFleur's, excuse me, a document was written by Greenwood LaFleur's son-in-law distributing the slaves to very Jackson LaFleur's slaves to various siblings. And those siblings are named in the document. The only thing was all of the siblings that were named in that document had passed away except for three. And they were Benjamin LaFleur, Basil LaFleur, and Greenwood LaFleur. So these are the people that acquired the slaves. They ended up purchasing the slaves of the deceased brother or sister and giving them the money and they kept the slaves. As it turned out, Caroline, Daniel, and Mary were grouped together. And they were grouped together because one of the siblings of Greenwood had passed away. So Caroline and Daniel went with Solomon and Mary to Carthage, Mississippi. But Delia was not as fortunate. She ended up going to Indian Territory as... Solomon LaFleur mentioned in his doll's application. So no more was heard of the group of slaves that went to Carthage with Benjamin LaFleur until 1870. By 1870, of course, they were older. Daniel was married to a lady named Delia Ann LaFleur. Solomon was married to a lady named Rachel LaFleur. And Mary married Nathan Witt. All of them had acquired land through the Homestead Act of 1862. Even Caroline. So everyone was with them except for Delia. And so Delia was in Indian Territory with Basil LaFleur. What I found out about these people, except for Benjamin LaFleur and Greenwood LaFleur, who owned, both of those people owned a lot of slaves because they had a lot of land. But I found out that Jackson LaFleur was not a greedy person for slaves. And, no, and Basil wasn't either. And neither was Forbes, who was the half-brother that lived in Oklahoma. It was kind of easy, as I discovered, to find Delia. Because if you would looked for Basil and looked for his slaves on the slave document you would see that he only had about six or seven in Oklahoma. But I, I searched for De Delia, and then I had to have help from a researcher, and she found Delia for me. She didn't find Delia, but she found her daughter. I did find Delia, who she might have been married to. So then... I looked for Delia in various places. Since Solomon said she went to Indian Territory, I put ads in newspapers in two of the largest cities, larger cities there, Ida Bell, Oklahoma, and Hugo. I ran ads at least every three months in the newspapers there. I sent letters to churches who a young uh, a man was nice enough to deliver those for me. 
I looked up local researchers and internet researchers and finally found a person right in my own backyard here in Fort Worth. And she ended up finding Delia. I had always known that she might have been in the Hugo area and she was in close proximity because 10 miles from Hugo was Delia in a community called Frogville, Oklahoma. So then when the researcher found Delia, she found her as a Choctaw Freedman. She had six children. I, it was kind of hard to keep up with even her because on various senses, her name changed so much from Caroline Wilson, who her, she had the children by a man named Jesse Wilson. But then her name changed to Caroline Smith. Then on another census, she was Caroline Freeney. And then after 1840, I didn't see her anymore, so I assumed she passed away. So she was a Choctaw Freedman. She acquired land. She received 40 acres, and she got to pick out the land she wanted. Her children acquired 20 acres. And they put all of this information on a card. And hers was Choctaw Nation. The card was similar to the card that was filled out on Solomon LaFleur. It has Choctaw Nation Freedman Row. So she wasn't applying for the Dolls Row. She was applying on the Freedman Row. And of course, she was not rejected because she was a Freedman. So then... On this card, it states her siblings, it states her slave owner, it states her mother and her father. Her mother is stated as Delia LaFleur. And then her father was Jim Mills. And her slave owner was Basil LaFleur. So she was a Choctaw Freedman, and what does that mean? Well, the Choctaws, they had to get someone to work their land, so they decided to take slaves too. So about 10,000 slaves were taken to Indian Territory, not only by the Choctaws, by the Chickasaws and the Cherokees as well. So then... The slaves were free in the United States in December 1865. The Cherokees were the best slave owners because they treated their slaves as equals. They even freed their slaves before 1865. They freed their slaves in 1863. But the other four civilized tribes one, the Choctaws being one of them, they refused to free their slaves in 1865. They didn't free their slaves until 1866. And because they wouldn't free their slaves until then, they decided to give those slaves the title Choctaw Freedmen's. So they had to force the Choctaws into freeing their slaves. First, they, had to, they wanted them to make them citizens of Choctaw Nation. Well, they didn't do that until 1885, but they ended up freeing their slaves in 1866. So then, Caroline was a freedman. And Delia would have been one had she survived. I don't know when she passed away, but I've been looking for a grave. And that was my purpose in going to Frogville, was to find her grave in that little uh, cemetery. The first lady I hired to help me do that actually cleaned up that cemetery. And I paid her to help me find uh, Delia. So that would have been the first place for her to look, and she didn't even bother to do that. 
So, at any rate, um, I ended up uh, becoming close to a lot of the descendants of this Delia LaFleur who reside now in Oklahoma. The lady that came to the reunion, Carlitha Parrish, her father, Johnny Wilson, was the youngest child of Daniel Wilson. So her father actually got land um, through the allotment. But he, like his mother, ended up, well, he was young at that time, so his mother, Caroline, ended up selling all of their land and hers, all for $200. But it wasn't worth that much anyway, because back then, one acre sold for like $1.50 or even $2. So um, she ended up selling the land, and so did some of the older children of hers. So then, there's a lot of rich history in the family of Delia LaFleur because Johnny Wilson, the brother that came before him, was Aaron Wilson, and he actually served in World War I, I believe. He was a soldier. Okay, I don't know how to end it now. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>